wanted to welcome into the space Mark and Kenna. How are you guys doing? Good. Thank you for Good. having us. Yeah, it's awesome to have you. What's been what's been going on at the farm this week? Give us the lay of the land. <laughs> Still a heat wave out here in Colorado. We're in like 95 degrees right now. It's been the kind of the same all through June, July, August. We had like a little bit of moisture to start the month and it just went straight to 90s and drought. Mm. So we're irrigating a lot. Luckily, the summer harvests are in full swing. Farm stands staying busy. Um, Kenna wrapped up all her mm -hmm. education programs, youth classes last week, mm -hmm. two weeks ago, our summer internship yes. program ended with the high schoolers. So, transitioning from kid time to just our main crew time and bringing in the harvest getting ready for farm dinner season oh it's exciting oh my gosh wow that was like you guys have everything exactly in the back of your mind you know what's going on that was like the back of your hand i love that <laughs> <laughs> oh amazing cool well we've got a good crew and maya how you doing today i'm doing good i'm excited to connect with you ken and mark and um it was so lovely touring your farm and being able to see your guys' soil and what you guys are doing and and the community building you guys are doing. So it's really nice to connect with you guys again after not seeing you for a couple months. Mm -hmm. So good, so good. Um, well, I love this. We, I think, can kind of kick things off. We've got a few more still kind of coming in as we go. Um, but... I'm just super excited and grateful for this conversation. Thank you so much, Mark and Kenna, for making the time to jump in and just share. I mean, you guys were just a part of the Meet a Farmer series here at Farmer's Footprint. And these sessions are really just a chance to dive a little bit deeper on your story, hear it in your words, and then ask some questions to farmers. I think that's a huge part of what this community gets really excited about is just the idea of like, wow, we can actually like have access to farmers' knowledge and get really inspired by the work that they're doing and then have a chance to like live follow up and you know get a better understanding of the work that's happening in boulder where you guys are based so super grateful for that um so today i would love to invite everyone if you're able to just uh hop on video if you're just listening that's totally fine too we're recording this session so we will have the replay available for everyone later um but Part of the kind of flow of what we'll do is Maya, who wrote and was able to interview and visit the farm with Mark and Kenna, um, is going to take us through some just kind of like a journey of questions, diving a little bit deeper on their work. And then we'll transition shortly in like the back half of the session to questions directly from y'all. So that'll be an awesome space. Just raise your hand, ask any of those burning questions directly to Mark and Kenna. Um, but it'll be a really intimate kind of free flowing conversation and we're gonna riff, we're gonna see where it ends up. So the power is in all of our hands in that sense and really excited for it. Um, one super quick little housekeeping would just invite everyone to head to Kenna and Mark's um, little Zoom window. And if you click those three dots in the right upper hand corner, you can pin their video. So you guys will kind of be able to like see them a little bit better if you're in gallery view on Zoom right now. Awesome. So I just want to share quickly um, a video that Leia, who's on our team and actually is in the call right now. What's going on, Leia? Um, she had a chance alongside Maya to go visit Mark and Kenna in Boulder, Colorado, and she created this gorgeous asset that is just absolutely, absolutely stunning um, and had the ability to, you know, be on site in that way with them. So just to give you guys a kind of a lovely little soft sense of their work. We are going to share that. So let me share the video with y'all. Excuse my messy screen. <laughs> Here we go. Our touching of the soil. We've totally disconnected our touching of the soil and our connection with those frequencies and those energies. Put your hand in the soil and just feel the energy, what it brings to you, what do you feel? Just that soft sensation is just magical. My name is Kenna. I come from Mexico. I am a mother, a farmer, an educator, and someone that is passionate about Mother Earth. And I'm Mark, and I'm an engineer turned full-time farmer, and really just a land steward trying to do my best to, to take care of the soils and the animals and the community around us. We, we are, are all in farms. farms. 
the big focus of Olin Farms is to create a meaningful space in the community where we can grow nutrient-dense food and really get healthy food into the community. Really just try to slow down this rapid pace of the human world that we're in and to be better stewards in the process. Besides growing food, we really take a strong focus on building a healthy ecosystem around the farm and around the community. We're doing a lot of perennial planting, a lot of pollinator habitat establishment, a lot of creek restoration, a lot of just trying to climate proof our farm. All in farms, the name is Anastic, so now what will work? Cool, and we're just gonna cue it there. Um, awesome. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah, okay, perfect, sweet. So I just wanna give like a, a real brief intro. We're gonna go deeper into Mark and Kenna's work, but in case anyone didn't have a chance to check out their full story, um, I think it's kind of beautiful just to set the stage a little bit and share that they founded All in Farms based in Boulder, Colorado in 2007. So for the past 14 years, their focus has been on food as medicine and celebration, and they've been growing nutrient dense produce for their community. So today really the question and kind of a theme that we're exploring with is how agriculture can support community. And I just have to applaud you two so powerfully because you're stewarding over 165 acres of land and on that land and from you know the, how you're interacting with the soil and the ecosystem and the community, you're feeding over 375 families weekly with your CSA boxes. Along alongside maintaining a busy summer farm stand and distributing you know, your produce to restaurants throughout Boulder County. So you guys are an absolutely integral part of the community. Um, and I know that we're gonna dive deep also into your work with Project 95, which is a project that you guys founded last year with the intention to steward public land. So that's amazing. And then Maya, you're gonna be guiding us through this next portion where we're just gonna get into conversation around what's new at the farm, what's happening, what the vision is. So thank you so much for being here. And Maya, thank you for being a really honored part of the Farmer's Footprint Writer Circle. Um, just honoring your work and your words and your wisdom as a food and environmental activist and student and writer. Thank you so much for connecting people back to the earth through everything involving food. So really appreciate you guys all being here. And Maya, I'd love to invite you. Let's, let's kick it off. Let's dive in. I want to hear from Mark and Kenna. <laughs> Thank you so much for that intro, Tori. I feel so honored. Um, you're so good at uplifting people. I love it. Um, the video I was so beautifully done um, by Leia. Thank you so much for capturing that. And we just had the most incredible time on Kenna and Mark's land. Um, the video actually stopped when they were about to explain Olin Farms, the, the meaning of Olin. Um, so for my first question for you guys is, do you mind diving into the meaning and significance of Olin Farms and how that kind of sets the foundation for your guys' view of farming? Well, um, we started gardening. We moved in this piece of land when we were decided to take care of Grandma Lee. We didn't want her to go to those places where usually elders are sent in this country. <laughs> and after the first year of, of growing, we decided like, I mean, it was not our things to do like to become farmers, but after experience the connection and trying and experimenting, we are like, okay, I think we're going into that side of life that we have been connected through years with our ancestors and we all have them in our spirit and in our soul. We were looking for a name we were thinking and thinking until all in pop out. I don't know. I think the spiritual world sent it to us. <laughs> and all in, it's uh, a constant motion, like life, like music. And, and that's what farming is. So it's not any day exactly the same in, in farming. And we, that's why we decided, okay, all in is gonna be the, the standard and the steward and the flag of, what we, of the future to come. And it's very nice and we're very happy that that was the name. <laughs> yeah, that's that's beautiful. And that's, um, I remember talking to you guys briefly, that's kind of uh, a token of respect to the ancestors to naming it Olin, correct? In the way that they 
they used to farm and the way that they stewarded land. Um, yeah, do you mind touching a little bit about how Aztec culture inspired you guys with farming or just indigenous farming in general? Well, I think in the, we're in a moment right now that we're going back to our roots and back, back to the origin. And all these cultures, they really, they were connected and respect mother nature and they, they did their daily life activities around this. And that's what it should be. We are here and we need to learn to give back. We have the chance to be here and it's just give back through your actions and your daily life activities. And that's what all in farms is. Mm -hmm. The Aztecs, you know, they adapted their lifestyle. They used, they used to be in a lake. So being adaptable, that's part of essential life of a farmer. We depend 100% a, on the weather and the land. So they adapted themselves to um, farming in, in Chinampas. And that's how they, it's it just magical, like these floating islands. And that's how they start just, okay, we're here. We are thankful for being here. How we're gonna do this? How we're gonna connect uh, with mother nature and just using what we are provide mm. at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, speaking of adaptation, Mark, one of my favorite quotes from this piece is that, you said that there's such thing as community supported agriculture, but there's also agriculture supported community. Um, so I was wondering if you guys wanna expand on that. Um, a little background, when Leah and I were touring this farm, every five minutes, there'd be someone passing by, honking their car, waving to Mark and Kenna, runners passing by, saying hello, saying, asking how their kids are and, it was very, very evident that you guys are such an integral part of your guys' community um, in Boulder County. And, um, and so I, I really liked what you said about agricultural supported community. So if you guys could expand on that, that would be lovely. Yeah, that, I think it started, um, I remember when we first started, like most young farmers, like we don't have a marketing budget in, the, in our, <laughs> In our um, annual budget, like we're just a farmer, just so busy growing and doing things, they're not running ads in the paper and doing things like that. <laughs> so, what one of the things that we really focus on early on was just like community engagement and getting being involved in community, going to local arts events, going to donating to local schools, fundraisers, things like that, and just trying to get involved with the community and local politics and local fundraising as much as possible. And that really helped like kind of put our name on the map here back 14, 13 years ago. And then it's expanded over time just to see, really ask like, what what is the role of farms within a community and how can a community benefit by having really resilient farms nearby and not just like the food that they produce and, and can get into the community, but also the the access to be able to come and touch the soil and be connected to nature and the youth programs that Canada does out here and last week we finished our third year of our high school internship program where we had 17 like high school and college youths uh, out working on the farm for the majority of them was their first paid job ever and just to be able to have that kind of opportunity for young kids to be able to come out and learn about work and learn about hard work. And maybe if 5% of them become farmers, that'll be a success, but all of them are gonna know what it means to show up on time and to work hard and then have that schedule. And that's another great piece that a farm can, can offer into the, the local community. Um, and then I think most importantly to Ken and I, it's just that, that food is medicine. Like that's the reason we started the farm is we were eating out of our own home garden. We came back here to take care of Grandma Lee. And, um, we're just like, wow, what the heck is this? This tastes freaking, I always say that my aha moment was eating a tomato out of the back field and being like, what the heck is this? I thought I didn't like tomatoes. And the scientist, the engineer in me wanted to know what the heck was going on with that tomato. And so the more I researched it, the more I realized that it was all about the soil and the soil health and picking a tomato ripe compared to picking it green and shipping it across the country is why the stuff out of the backyard tastes a thousand times better than the stuff at the grocery store. And then we really looked at how much the nutritional profile, like all that flavor, all those sugars that you taste in that tomato directly correlate to the phytonutrients and all the, the real food is medicine piece of it. So that's where we really put our focus is like if we're ever going to have a serious talk about healthcare in this country, we really need to, to have a serious talk about our agricultural systems and what is the fuel that we're putting inside 
our body and should it always just be the cheapest thing possible? Probably not. It should be probably the, that's actually where we should be looking for more. There's value shoppers looking for the cheaper thing and then the value shoppers looking for like a high value product. And then so we really looked at what is that, what kind of value can we bring with, with products into the community to, to share health and to share medicine in many ways and to share stories and cultures and being able to take like a, a wide variety of stuff to the farmer's market, to the farm stand and see all these ethnic people come and share stories and, and recipes from the countries they came from. Like it's, that's a really valuable piece. Like it's a great connector as this part of Boulder County becomes more and more diverse. Like we can really use food as like a cultural hub to, to integrate people and to share stories and, and to make it more inclusive. Mm, mm, I love that. Um... Do you guys mind touching, you touched a little bit about Kenna's education programs and the senior program you guys run every year. Um, I know you guys run a few different ones from your guys' festivals to your elderly outreach. Do you mind touching about, touching on a few of your favorite community outreach programs that you guys get people on the farm? Uh, well, I, I love bringing kids to the farm. Uh, it's been changing through the years. This year, I decided to have a different theme each week. So we talk about pollinators, habitats, the importance of bees in our life. We talk about how we are connected to soil, what is important. We talk about uh, health and, and five colors in your plate. So it is just fascinating to see the first round. I mean, the class is outside under the trees. We, it's a very hands-on activity. We do our chores every day. We feed the sheep, the, the gallinitas, and collect the eggs. And the kids are, it's interesting with their moms, you know, next day is like, mom, apurate, come on, come on, I have to do my chores. And they're like, what's going on here, you know? And it's amazing to see the process of asking a simple question that, about what is soil? And the first day, all of them will say, it's the ground, it's the ground, it's, it's dirt. But then as, as the days evolve, it's like, what is soil? You know, soil is life. Soil, soil is what nurtures our plants that they're gonna feed us later. So the soil is the one that holds our homes and the trees and the trees give us oxygen. So it's just amazing to see the seed. And for me, that's my role, just to plant that seed in these future humans that um, can change the, the directory that where, where we're going as a humanity oh i love that um yeah one of another one of my favorite quotes that you guys also said is that we always talk about leaving um a better planet for the next generation but we never really talk about leaving a better generation for our planet like the yeah. educating the next generation to take care of our planet exactly. yeah, and that's that's very powerful as well Yes, and at the end, you know, it's all about respect and, and, and be grateful of what we have and the chance that we have and just to learn to give back and, mm -hmm. and learn because, you know, you can be exposed to other beautiful things, but if no one tells you, you know, we need to, you know, one of, our, of the last circles we did is like the kids, you're going to choose something, one element for mother nature and you're going to be the voice starting today. Mm -hmm. And the kids just stand up and I'm going to be the voice of the trees and the air and the, and the bears and the seeds. And it's just amazing to see because I told them, you know what, guys, there's a lot of adults taking the wrong decisions for your future. So you need to start now and be the voice of those ones who does not have a voice. Mm -hmm. Wow. So powerful. So powerful. Um, Speaking, speaking of change and kind of fostering for the next generation, um, do you guys mind talking about some of the obstacles that you guys have overcome with community support and like through your education programs and relying on the community as the community relies on you? Um, maybe talking a little bit about the flood that happened in 2013. I remember that was a, that was a brief story you guys told us about community support on the farm. Yeah, and, um, obstacles in farming. Like, we could talk hours and hours about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a give and take and come and go. And there's um, different programs that are great one year. And a lot of a lot of some of our like innovative like education outreach programs 
um like one of the, my favorites from that's going on this year is like this uh, story time on the farm where we have preschool local we have a grant where local preschools can come out and get a tour of the farm and Kenna's reading the, the story and they we get a set of books that they take back to the preschool and we got some funding so that there's a uh, like a, a big chunk of veggies that either goes home with the parents or goes to the school for their snacks and it's um, just awesome to see. Like to me, that's like one of those points. That there's an old farmer who says like the most important thing to figure out is what are the critical points of influence as a farmer. And there's always a to-do list forever. But what few things can you focus your attention on that have the biggest impact? Mm -hmm. And so in farming, maybe that's giving like a foliar spray, some extra nutrients to the peppers and tomatoes, right when they're flowering, or making sure your minerals are set in the beginning of the year. Um, but to me, like the education programs, like that preschool age is such a critical point of influence because not only are you educating the preschoolers in the early age, a lot of times they come with the parents and these are a lot of times like first like first time parents that are kind of navigating this, this new world as well and to kind of connect them to a farm and talk about the importance of healthy eating and brain development and, and, and healthy living is just awesome to see and, and so that's one of my favorite things but it's an obstacle because like we spend all this time generating these things and these programs and making this curriculum and getting we're doing all this research for books and stuff and then after like a year kind of the grant money runs out but like in our hearts we kind of want to keep pushing those forward so i think one of the biggest obstacles as a really community oriented farm that kind of sometimes relies on grants to start new programs up is that once the grants run out we're still pushing those those programs forward just kind of on our own and trying trying to find like more permanent sources of funding to, to keep a lot of these programs running is would be uh, would be a, a big piece of it um weather is always going to be a challenge like yeah 2013 there was some really 100,000 year flood that happened in in boulder county we we're down by a, a left hand creek which ended up flooding and um and it was like right in the middle of september like in our busiest time of harvest it just shut everything down the markets closed we were all in disaster mode for a couple of weeks and it was it was a big financial strain on on everybody on the farm on um clean up but in in that time like the community like i remember you know i was telling the story of like just, I was just thinking what the heck we're gonna do and here's all these kids and families and parents that just like showed up at the driveway with shovels and kids that have been coming to the summer classes like where do we pitch in and that's where you kind of see the the cycle of of help and giving kind of come and go that it's a it's really a balance and that's what it means to be a agricultural supported community that sometimes the community needs to carry the farm and sometimes the farm can help carry the community but it's mm -hmm. it's always in motion it's always a flow um and yeah the obstacles like hail like we're a farm that believes in like nutrient dense produce like we're really interested in just growing outdoors and the elements and the soil like probably more the more profitable farms we see are going all indoors hydroponic temperature controlled and they're making beautiful vegetables but to me they're just not really much nutrition there not a lot of flavor there and it's um and so we grow everything outside under the elements which means when it's 90 degree heat for weeks and weeks <laughs> like we're scrambling to keep everything watered and but it's beautiful to see like this year in the tomatoes like that when a plant's healthy and resilient and it goes through those stresses you actually get a more awesome like flavor profile in the tomatoes and peppers this year's tomatoes are some of the best we've ever tasted and i think it's because they've gone through all this this heat stress and like we've been keeping the water on them and keeping them growing and they're just amazing this year so there's that's that's part of the balance but there's years where in 2018 we had multiple hailstorms and uh, terrible times of the year that just like really set us back and and made it difficult and that year like financially it, it's just a high high risk they're for young for small farms diversified farms there's no crop insurance uh, available to us all the usda department of agriculture crop insurance are tied to commodities often tied to chemical use and glyphosate use it's like it's there's nothing available to these really like market farms and csa farms they're growing a little bit of everything so when some disaster happens it's all on us to to carry it forward and in 2018 when that happened as well we saw an outpouring of support from the community and like a little hail relief fund that kind of helped us bridge over into 2019 and keep going but often that's what it takes is just being able to ask for help when, when you need it and realizing that's often the cards are stacked against these young and young and diversified farms. Mm -hmm. um, what do you guys think is a solution to uplift these local farms? Um, if you guys could do policy change or community change, what would be a vision for you guys to support local agriculture? 
we have been in a lot of meetings <laughs> 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 with people that I don't know. I always say they just hit their seats <laughs> <laughs> and they don't understand. They don't understand because they are not there doing it every day. They have a perspective and an idea, but I mean, it's different when you are out there every day. And yes, we need new people that is going to make the new rules that really understand, that really care. And it's not just to feel papers and things like that. You know, they really, really want to see the change. They really want to see a different future. They really believe on it. So that's when the change is going to come. I think really we're busy. I mean, there was a point that we were like, oh my gosh, we have been in all these meetings and all this with our pancartas and, you know, <laughs> change the rules or, or be more flexible or come on. We are, we are not 40 years ago. It, things have changed and the way of farming have changed and the farmers have changed. The way of seeing things have changed. And we need people who really, really get it, taking the decisions. That's what I've seen the same thing. Like we've dealt with in, in like policy and sometimes even like good things like grants from like the county level, from the state level, from the federal level. We've, we've gone through paperwork with all these different organizations. We've had meetings, all these different organizations. And really at the end of the day, it comes down to, is there somebody in those organizations that, that really cares and wants to go out of their way to, to make change? That's the only time we've really seen change really happen is there has to be somebody within USDA or within county policy or within the state that is just pushing things forward. Um, and, and Ken and I did like a few years ago, kind of come to the conclusion, like we're just not gonna go to any more city council <laughs> meetings or public county commissioner meetings. And we're just gonna spend all of our effort on really trying to build an example here of what we wanna see happen. And hopefully as um, Alan Savory famously said, um, like um, that, uh, was it, sorry, I'm blanking on my quote, that um, policy doesn't lead, it follows. And I think that's been a really big thing. So. In, in our heads, like we need to build something that policy can look at and then start following. And I think the biggest in the last two years, especially since the pandemic and COVID, the thing that gets me the most excited is where I see the most progress right now is in um, like farmer to farmer collaboratives, farmer to farmer cooperatives. Mm -hmm. um, I call it, um, and my term for it is like farmer to farmer to consumer. Like we are selling our stuff at our farm, but we're also partnering with 10 to 12 other local farms to have their things at our farm stand and our virtual farm stand, some of their items in our CSA sometimes. And so it doesn't make sense for every farm to grow every single product, but there's other people that grow potatoes and have the potato diggers and have the corn planters and let them grow the corn and potatoes and let's work directly with them. So a handful of these and, and like really the only people we wholesale to is other farmers that have farm stands or other farmers that retired and now they're distributing to restaurants. Uh, their farmers that started their own farmers markets. So like the only, like we know that where their hearts are and, and we have to collaborate with them to support them in their ventures. So it's this farmer to farmer to consumer, I think is, is really the future. Like I don't, I've been, I haven't thought, thought about politics at all this year and it's been a pretty fun year. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's so much opportunity there. I mean, there's just not enough room in our, in our food system for like the cost of production for this high quality food is just too high. And there's only a certain amount that the that the public is is willing to pay, or in some in many cases we can't afford to pay. Like we are in a lot of programs, like in food assistance programs, where we're getting grants to make our food more available to people in the community. Um, so there's just there's just not room for middlemen in it. Like we have to go right from the farmer to the consumer and, and try to cut out as many of the other middlemen as possible. If the farmers have a chance to to make a living and the consumers have a chance to find an affordable product. And so that's that's really to me where the future lies is farmer partnerships going straight to consumers. Mm. Yeah, the future is collaborative. I love that. We all need it. We all float together. Um, Speaking of collaboration and different people from different fields or even different farmers partnering up, um, do you mind talking about a little bit about Project 95 and the amount of collaborations you guys have there and um, what, what the project entails? You may take that. Sure. So um, a little more background on our farm. So we own like the six acres that uh, I grew up on and where my grandpa was that we moved back to. 
And then thing that's really made our farm able to expand is in Boulder County, there's a lot of Boulder County open space, which is publicly owned land. Back in the 70s, when all the farms are going out of business, taxpayers here said, go ahead and tax us and let's make a pool of money to buy these farms going out of business so that they don't just get developed over and we can keep this kind of green belt around Boulder and Boulder County and, and actually preserve some agricultural land. And so the county owns something like 27,000 acres of uh, agricultural land. I think something around like seven or 8,000 of that comes with water rights and has irrigation water and is ready to farm. And a lot of the rest of it's kind of rangeland. And um, so it makes it like an affordable way to get on land, at least from the county. There's downsides where you can't build any infrastructure there and the county kind of pain in the butt landlord, but there, <laughs> there, it's, there's it's still this opportunity. So luckily next to us was 14 acres open space that we started leasing um, about 12 years ago. And that's where all our summer crops have gone on to. And, um, and then last year we started leasing additional 135 acres uh, across the street from us of a pretty degraded um, land. This, this parcel had kind of been up for lease a couple of times, just high weed pressure, the water rights, water's kind of done like mid, mid July. So it makes it really hard for veg, veggie farming, but it could be used for like, hay or maybe a corn, getting a corn crop or pasture is kind of what we're looking at to do out there. But it's an example of like, we have so much of this large open space land and still the majority of the, the irrigated parts. 10 years ago, there was, it was a lot of it was in um, uh, GMO corn and GMO sugar beets, all the glyphosate based were, um, and so there's the public outcry here in Boulder County, you're like, hey, we should get these GMOs off of our open space land. But we've been like 10 years down this road of, of um, talking and they're still, it's still there. They're still haven't found any economic alternatives for these farmers to, to one guy in a tractor. I mean, what else is he gonna do besides spray if he has a hundred acres to manage? And so we took on that, that project and got some funding from some neighbors who want to invest in it and a little bit from Boulder County to really try to do a demonstration of what does regenerative agriculture look like on like a hundred acre plus parcel. And um, so the first couple of years, we've just been cover cropping out there. Uh, we got some grants with some pollinator groups to be able to get some pollinator, pollinator mixes into the, into the cover crop mix, like some uh, hairy vetch and uh, a lot of clovers, a lot of sunflowers. They have a beautiful sunflower field going this year. And all that just kind of just gets mowed in and, and incorporated back into the soil. And, and sure enough, like the soil is really, just in two years, really starting to improve over there. Um, so in that process, um, we've worked with NRCS, uh, that's National Resource Conservation Service, that's part of USDA, and put conservation plans on those on those two properties, the one that, that 14 acres that we have been leasing and the new 135 acres. And a conservation plan is kind of like a cost share where anything that's building soil health or water retention or an increase in ecosystem health, there'll be some cost shares from USDA for those cover crops or for movable fences for rotating animals. We've started an on-farm composting project through that program um, and just forage planning so put more pollinator stuff out and around the fields. Uh, and one of our big focuses on like this this move to perennial, I think if we're going to be serious about carbon sequestration and long-term regenerative agriculture, we really need to start looking at more perennial crops that we don't have to be out there tilling the ground every year and planting. So what that looks like for us is um, a lot of um, hedgerows within our, our um, production fields. And that came after that 2018 hailstorms or the last hailstorm in mid-August that just like toasted all of our tomatoes and peppers it was just like pea-sized hail, but it came with like 70 mile per hour winds that just came in sideways and so all those plants just got shredded down. And so that year, like that was like my 10th year, our 10th year in farming and my body was kind of starting to wear out with the <laughs> land, like oh, the wetlands wearing out after this. And like, I really, and this gets back to that kind of indigenous wisdom of like, I really, those kind of teach you, like not think you have all the answers in your head, but really just try to be quiet and listen to the land and ask the land what it needs. And I think indigenous cultures were a lot better at doing that than, than our, our modern cultures. And in that process, land was like, I just need to be storm proof. Like we really need some wind breaks out here. So that's when we started going down the road within our CS of getting hedgerows within our within our production. So a two acre field of tomatoes will have eight different rows of whether it's like a, a, a plum bush or a gooseberry or elderberries or currants, something that can make like a little four foot wall of uh, wind protection. We space those every 40 feet apart. So we're still growing like eight or 10 rows of tomatoes in between these wind breaks. And but it's it's a challenge too. Like all getting we get all those things planted, watered, sourcing those plants. It just added a whole another layer of, of complexity and 
we've been working through all that and still like a lot of those cost shares as the farmer puts up all the money up front and does everything and at the end the nrcs comes like okay and they'll pay for their part at the end but still it's, the risk is all on the farmer up front as always so we're really trying to find new ways to through grants or through donations to really try to offset some of those costs early on and, and, and make it more um, equitable so that the risk isn't always on the farmer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I love that. And I love how Project 95 is kind of setting a model and you guys are doing like soil testing and collaborating with local universities too. So you guys can be a lot model for land stewardship to kind of show to Boulder County of like, this is what happens when you allow people to steward the land here that's just sitting here. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, I think that's very powerful. I can, I can talk a little bit about the name 95 too. So we live on 95th Street, which is this um, side of like South side of Longmont, right outside of a boulder count in our outside or east of boulder and um so we kind of call it 95th not project 95 because we kind of view this side of of longmont as um, there's a lot of progressive thinkers a lot of private homeowners that want to see regenerative agriculture on their farmlands and um it's so really trying to make this as like an epicenter of regenerative learning and knowledge in this part of colorado there's another special meaning to us for the 95 as well as where they say the perfect soil is 25 percent air 25 percent water 45 percent minerals and five percent organic matter and um, all the focus in regenerative agriculture is on that like five percent organic matter all the carbon markets all the uh, all the policy shit things are all around that carbon, 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 and and they kind of leave out the other ninety five percent. And to me, as uh, we realize, like in our day to day operations on the farm, what I'm thinking about when I wake up in the morning to when I go to bed at night is really the other ninety five percent. How do I manage the air and water in my soil through? tilling at the right time, not when it's too wet, not too dry, when to water, how not to overwater, how to apply minerals in the off season to make sure that 45% minerals is in the exact proportions to really make nutrient dense food. And if you do all that right, the organic matter becomes, it's just a byproduct, because as long as this, if you got those seeds and the plants in the ground and you manage the other 95%, then, then the organic matter is gonna show up and you're gonna get to that 5% organic matter in, in these fields. So it's kind of a reminder too of to, to focus on what, what we need to focus on not necessarily the end goal it's just like nutrient dense food is a byproduct of a well-managed soil so is the organic matter and carbon sequestration at the end of the day is is just a byproduct of, of good management it's, it's not the focus of it wow i love that i love thank you so much for educating and sharing your guys's knowledge with all of us um before we wrap up our final question uh, before we wrap up our to our transition to our q a i want to ask you guys a final question um, what advice would you guys give to new farmers or the next generation of farmers from what you guys have learned or just a piece of advice? And, and Ken is actually on the board of the, there's a National Young Farmers Coalition is a great national organization supporting young farmers and, and a lot of advocacy and just collaborative movement. And so Ken is on the board of the the Flatirons branch here, which is a really healthy and growing. And out of the pandemic, there was a lot of uh, people that started farming for the first time in Boulder County. We saw new people coming to the farmers market for the first time, and it's it's a challenge. So, what do you think out of? Well, what I have noticed all these young farmers, they have it in their heart. They want to do it. They believe in it. They want to be part of the change. Is just stay strong, keep going, ask for help, collaborate. Just find that time of breathing. You know, you need to stop and breathe and say, okay, I did this wrong. I can learn from this. I need to keep going because we need more people like them that they really, it's coming from here. Yeah. So it's, you are gonna make mistakes. We're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna need help. We need help of people. Just ask, ask for help, get involved with the community, get to know your mission and your vision of your life and the farm. And there's always there that is someone there is gonna help you. <laughs> I like that. <clears throat> I think a um, good piece of advice I heard like 14 years ago when we were starting a farm, an old farmer um, told me a lot of advice, but two things that really stuck with me that kind of became mantras is, um, 
number one, like there's always going to be an endless amount of complexity and things you got to know about when you're a farmer, but the, the, your number one focus has to be on quality as the farmer. Like as long as you put a quality product into the community, the rest is going to take care of itself in the long run. Just make sure you don't ever take your eye off the quality. Mm -hmm. And then number two is always have seeds in the ground. And, and <laughs> there's times where I wake up nervous that I don't have seeds in the ground. <laughs> and it's and it's true from farming to and just cycling as a veggie okay. farm that grows like 30 or 40 different varieties of veggies, like that all of them gets planted at different times. But it's also important as a uh, as a business model, I think that's another thing that we've come to realize all one of constant motion and constant change is like none of our two years in business has ever looked the same. Like we've always been starting new projects or get letting go of some other ones. And so that's uh, metaphorical to your business model. You always have new seeds in the ground. You can never get complacent as a farmer and think, oh, all these CSA people will be back next year. All these restaurant contracts that I got it made were set. Like you always, always got to be getting seeds in the ground. I just started working with the grocery store in Fort Collins this morning that's taken all of our excess tomatoes and that was thanks to from five years ago that this guy used to be a purchaser in Boulder and just connected back again and now they're helping us move the rest of those tomatoes so there's always opportunities out there you always have to be on the lookout and you always have to just keep keep those seeds keep watering those seeds in the ground I love that thank you guys so much um wow so much knowledge so much wisdom you guys have. Thank you again for um, taking the time to be with us. I know that farmers are busy. You guys aren't behind computer screens. You guys are in the soil. And so um, thank you so much for taking the time to do that. Uh, Tori, do you, we wanna transition to the Q&A so that everyone kind of gets a chance to ask and unmark some questions? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you guys so much. That was a blast. It's cool to dive deep and I love the symbolism, the analogies that you guys brought forth in so many different ways. Um, to me, something that you just said, Mark, really stood out that I think in business, it's like this idea of constant exponential growth. And I love that you brought in like releasing and letting go and just like modeling how you guys are working in the world and in your community with what you're seeing on the farm and in nature. So there's such beautiful biomimicry and learnings in that. So great. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, so heck yeah, guys, let's do Q&A. This is my favorite part. We had a few questions come in through the chat. Um, this is your guys's, we've got like a, another half hour or so or 25 minutes that we can do some questions. I have some burning questions um, as well, but you guys are front in line. So um, we had two really awesome questions come through um, with our good friend, Henrik. Um, Henrik, I'm wondering if you'd like to jump off mute and kind of dive a little bit deeper into, um, I, I loved your question. Have you been able to identify what ingredient has been there to make you so successful? Um, so Mark and kind of just kind of like, what are the key success ingredients and really what's needed for more regenerative agriculture like yours to come around? Like what's that recipe for success? Um, and what have the learnings been from that process? So. Enrique, I'll invite you to kind of jump in and elaborate if you want. Okay, it seems like I got some sound. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all of this introduction and your story. Um, when I was just reading about you prior to the event on the Farmer's Footprint, I mean, I was so emotional because you were pretty much describing something that seemed perfect to me. <laughs> so... Um, I was just wondering if you have been able to identify what quality you bring to this work that actually make it work, if you get what I mean. Um, because it seems like you're doing so many things and you're succeeding. It, that's the impression that I got. So obviously it's not easy, but what is it that, that make you be able to pull it off? Have you been able, haven't given any thought about that? Need answer. So the question is like, what it makes us keep going? What's our secret ingredient to survive? Yes. Working there are so many others, they try, okay? And, and community thing is very difficult and, and there are so many obstacles, but it just seems like you, you are succeeding and, and maybe you've had a time to reflect upon what's, what's the important lessons there that we need to learn? Um, I think when you believe in something, 
in my in my case is the kids the kids is the clue we it's so hard to re-educate an adult but the kids are just there and we can learn a lot from the kids i have learned so much from them so it is that moment i just see a kid and i go like okay just let it be with me one week and I, it's just keep going and believe that a good change is coming we don't need to give up we just need to believe that we need to keep doing this and in my case the more beautiful souls we reach is more people doing in the they're rowing on the same path so for me it's just keep going if you believe in something just Keep, keep how, how, how do you connect with your community when you when you talk to people or how do you make that connection or how do you, Thank you. make them interested or get them inspired <laughs> so, yeah i think ken is really secret sauce is like her huge heart and that's that's how she connects the community and now she keeps going and i think that's been like one of our secret weapons on the farm for sure is kenna just has this huge heart when she's talking to somebody one-on-one -on -one, whether it's a kid or when we used to do the farmer's markets like people would come to the farmer's market just to like get some gossip and give kenna a hug and like people would just come for a hug honestly <laughs> like they just needed a hug and <laughs> and it's um that she just has like this big outpouring heart and she's always um so open to to share and to, to provide some optimism into people's lives that that's been a huge, huge piece of it. I think probably uh, my secret sauce is um, looking at, at failures as opportunities, I think is really important, like from floods to hailstorms to a crop failing to the county telling me no like 20 times when I ask them for things. <laughs> like one time I had a meeting uh, just last year, one of this county employee had been like at three different organizations, like and I was at another meeting for another NRCS thing was like, after it's like, Mark, I don't get it. Like, you just keep getting told oh, no over and over and over. And, <laughs> and you just keep asking, like, what, why? And I, and I said, well, I, uh, we pretty much, I learned that by looking at nature. Nature never just gives up. Like, if we look at a, a, an animal dying, like, it doesn't just give up. It's always pushing, pushing, pushing. Nature always pushes forward. And so I learned how to, to, to try to be like nature and try to go with the flow of nature. And if something bad happens, um, to, to really find the silver lining and to build around that. When the pandemic happened and we can go to the farmer's market, we had a great time to like learn how to do online sales and online farmer to farmer distribution. When the, when the flood happens, great time to like really look at our creek ecosystem that just got devastated and how we as farmers can, can learn how the creek would heal itself over 20 years or what we can do with those critical points of influence to bring it back amazing like in two or three years. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that's been a really big piece is like when we've been told no, or when we failed at something, it just inspires us to do better like that. And I think <laughs> that's what's kept us going for my side. And then Kenna is just like, she has this magnetic heart that just draws in the community and, and people love her and trust her. <laughs> amazing. Thanks so much. That was amazing. Secret sauce. I love that question. Thanks, Henrik. <laughs> Just making secret sauce over here. Uh, so good. Um, yeah, and if anyone else wants to navigate to participants, and then there's a button that says raise hand. So if y'all want to get in line, we can ask a question live. But Aaron had a really beautiful question around your educational program. So Aaron, I'd love to invite you to jump in and ask. Sure. Hi, thank you so much for meeting with all of us. Um, I'm wondering about, yeah, your educational program. So I'm not an educator by trade or training, um, but I, I love doing community outreach. Um, and from my science background, taking that to, to kids and people and getting them outside. So I was wondering if you, um, if you like created formal education through lesson plans or um, just kind of came up with activities um, from your experience on the farm or if you have educational background and training that was used to create those programs that have become so successful and integral in your community or how, how exactly did you get started with that? You know, uh, it was this mom everything started once upon a time there was this mom with these little kids that she came to me and i mean after getting to know each other i will say a little bit she just trust 
trusted me and say like, what if the kids can stay like a summer with you? I can see that you have this good energy and this. So my first summer class was for kids. Okay. Uh, I, at that point, I didn't, I had it in me. I think we all are educators in a certain point. We all have our own style. And I was like, yeah. Oh, can I bring two more friends? So, yes, no problem. They're going to be here good. They're going to help me with everything. And that's how we started it. And then that's your heart connects to your head. And then your head connects to your action. And I started just thinking and thinking and evolved through the years. And, you know, my second, my second year, one of those kids, he came every year for the next 12 years. Oh, wow. And recently I saw his mom and she told me, you know what? Toby just wrote his paper for college. He wants to be an environmental geologist. And me say, he talks about you and I want to cry because it's <laughs> just, that's what we want. And you come with your plans. In my case, I come with my plans in my head, my heart, obviously through the years because all the regulations you need to start taking I started like, like taking classes here and so taking classes there just to be more in the formal line of the regulations but people trust us people really really trust us and people say some people is like you know I don't care about the regulations I can I do see what you guys are doing I believe in you I do believe more in you than in a piece of paper with a bunch of rules mm-hmm. and you know, and things changed. A few years ago, they start saying that chickens were terrible for little kids and these. So I needed to take away my preschooler classes uh, in the farm. And they were like, why you took them out? I don't want to go through that thing. I don't want to go. Okay, I'm just, I feel so bad because I know the potential of the three-year-old kids. Mm-hmm. And then you figure it out how you can do it, you know? So I start doing it through the city and they register through the city, they come here and you need to find ways to navigate if you really believe in it. And in my case, I know what's what I believe in that and you need to figure it out how, you know? And in my case, I do it in English and Spanish. So that opens the perspective and the door to other things and to unite cultures and to, to bring people together and do things a little, learn from each other. So started, with a coin in the air and, and a heart. Through the years, it just move on, move on. And I went through a lot of trainings. So when people come and tell me something, oh, you know, I have this certification. I have this one, I have this one, I have this one. And you just need to believe, that's it. Yeah. I think the, and it's evolved too. Like I think early on, it was less um, structured and formal, but I think like what we've really kind of evolved towards, whether it's the summer classes or hosting field trips, is this idea we teach like farm as ecosystem and how everything on the farm is connected from the chickens, the sheep, to the veggies, the compost, a little bit of the creek natural wildlife along the creek. And the big focus is on like hands-on activity. That's like the core of our curriculum is like, we do have different stations where we have a group of like 40 or 50 kids, we'll break them up into groups of 15 and we'll have like three or four of our employees at different stations that people wrote, the groups will rotate in between. Some will be like feeding the, feeding the chickens and getting the eggs. Some will be taking like old uh, broccoli plants out of the field that have already been harvested, taking those over to the sheep. Some will be seeding stuff in trays in the greenhouse and they'll kind of learn how everything's um, moves and then interconnects around the farm and really how the farm functions as, as an ecosystem. We've seen like when kids are busy and their hands are moving, especially touching earth or touching plants or touching animals, like they're just, this thing happens in the brain where they just are a lot more open to, so as they're, as even like preschoolers, as they're like doing these activities, we'll be talking to them in the back about, so this is, this is how we conserve resources. This is how this fits in with this. We're talking like ecosystem science with kids, whether they're preschoolers or college kids, we're talking the same ecosystem science and some of it absorbs, some of it um, may just bounce off. But over time, like we've really seen that to be like the, the best models, get them physically active, engaged, and then start laying a little bit more of the sciencey stuff. And we do work with um, 
like when high school or high schools come for a tour, we'll talk to their science teachers and see what they're learning. And, and it's amazing to be able like to try to teach somebody like carbon cycle and carbon farming, like in a classroom on a, on a board is like, oh my gosh, that'd be, that'd be tough. But if, that, if they can stand down by the creek or we have like multiple layers of green and we're planting perennials and you can see the ecosystem just flourishing, like that's that's where learning can really take place and so we can get like technical and, and we have in the past there's some engineer students that come and do a kind of like smart farming designs or doing like automatic sprays and the greenhouse and things like that so it, it can vary and it really depends on on the teacher and the, which classes you're working with and what what they want to kind of bring to it and um but really the, the our core curriculum is to get their hands moving get them touching soil touching plants being with the animals and then and then start teaching them things so don't just see them can't just sit them in a chair <laughs> very cool thank you mm -hmm. amazing i'd love to keep the questions coming in gang we've got a few more minutes here as well so if we have a few more um, I know we have one more from Henry, but before we jump to that one, I'm really curious because you guys just touched on this. Uh, it's kind of a two part question, but around conservation and how it intersects with agriculture. I think you guys are doing a lot of that work um, on in Project 95 and on those acres. I know you're doing some creek restoration work. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, like in your personal experience, how what do you see the benefits of linking like a farm and the ecology through that bridge of conservation? And then also I'm really curious, like what drew you guys into exploration of conservation on your land? Like what was the motivating factors for it? Yeah, I think we've, we've kind of had it in our hearts and because we live here and our kids are growing up here, like it's, it's kind of natural to want to make it as beautiful and as healthy as possible. But I think that really that 2013 flood um, was a big eye-opening event, like how much it just destroyed the creek ecosystem and made us think like as farmers, what, what can we do to, to help this, this be able to rehabilitate a lot quicker and we were down cover cropping, making some temporary berms, planting a lot of perennial shrubs and trees even along, along the creek. Now we're doing a lot more like um, mushroom piles and, and taking dead branches and stacking them and doing kind of like hugo culture and and just trying to make the most resilient um, ecosystem possible. Like that's that's kind of the, I guess the conservation piece is like, how can we grow food for the community, but at the same time leave a healthier ecosystem along around the farm? I think that's something that modern agriculture has to figure out. Like so much of our modern agriculture is, is happening from, um, from a really depletion kind of standpoint or even a, a I guess extractive mentality I guess you could say that um, where they're extracting minerals ex using chemicals that'll make ecosystems downriver go go south real fast and so how can we really increase the, the ecosystem them at the same time around food and, and how is it even possible when it's barely making a living growing the food how can we like shift resources to making these healthy ecosystems around the side so i think that's probably the biggest challenge is how, how do we fund those things since there's some cost shares through nrcs some private donations some little grants that we have to move these things forward but it, it's been a struggle to, to find the resources in the time like we do a lot of like through november through march like we have time to dream and build compost piles and, and mushroom piles but like as soon as veggie season hits like we're totally like full-time farming all the time so how do we keep those programs going and it'd be nice to have like some interns that we could pay year-round just to focus on those things I think that's probably what it's going to take to really keep that pushing forward but there's always things you can do just just diversification is the, the easiest way to, to add health to your farm like the, plant, the more varieties of things you're planting the more diversity there's above ground the more diversity biologically there's going to be a, a below ground and that's been a core piece. What we're, we're doing is just always trying to add diversity and then shift more of that diversity into perennials that don't have to be replanted every year that can provide more long term uh, bird habitat, more long term pollinator <laughs> habitat. Uh, and in many ways can be offer a lot of medicinal, a lot of those medicinal herbs and a lot of the medicinal berries are our perennials. There just isn't economic models and how to grow those at, at large scales. That's what we're trying to really experiment with is, is to look at more of those perennial crops and, and how can they become more of our, our staple crops. That is so fascinating. Yeah, how do you create the wheel that spins itself and in the meantime have people helping and funding coming in to, to really generate 
like that biodiversity kind of exploding out from the epicenter of perennials and pollinator habitats and compost trials and all of these things. It's also just so much to hold. I'm really struck with that where I'm like, you guys are creating and creating and then there's like this intense summer harvest of veg where you're like, oh my gosh, we have to keep now all of the balls in the air that we're juggling. Um, I just want to source you guys with like awesome humans who can come help all of that. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, awesome. Chris, do you want, do you have any interest in, oh, he's unable to talk. Cool. All right. I'm going to elevate a question that we just had come in from Chris. It's technical and I actually love when we get to some of these more technical ones. Um, so he's curious if you offer apprenticeships and maybe answer that one first. And then he has another kind of follow-up question. Um, apprenticeships, we do, I mean, um, we have two uh, young farmers that joined us this year that are both kind of mid-20s that um, we're hoping that they're here for, for many years. They're both great. Uh, that's, that's one of the really cool things we see is there's a lot of young people like in their mid-20s, even high schoolers that just are passionate about this. And they, the next generation of farmers are going to be a lot more kind of permaculture minded, mm -hmm. a lot more heart and earth, earth focused, but can is right now there's just not these kids are getting out of college often with these dreams of wanting to do like great ecological work. There's just not that many like paid jobs out there to, to get this done. And so we are looking at ways to, like we brought on a couple this year as, as full-time employees. Um, we host a lot of um, college volunteer groups or ecological classes that come from CSU or CU and come do a day on the farm and kind of hear about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that's very educational for them. Uh, we partner with the local organization, uh, Wildlands Restoration Volunteers, that comes and does a lot of the, per the perennial plantings with us and brings out groups of volunteers, and we give them a talk every time they come to kind of learn about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So there's there's a lot of ways to get on the farm and, and to learn more about it. Um, and then even, yeah, there's the high school apprenticeship program is, is huge, and, and a, lot more, a lot of them are just here for a summer job and, and, some, and some pay, but at the same time, like, if we're dropping those about like what it means to, to be a steward of land and to be a steward of your community's health through food and um, so there's different ways that we have these apprenticeship programs another key piece is like workshare CSAs I think are another nice piece that um, our, our microgreen operation is, is run by my, my retired mother who's 78 or something and she has a bunch of seniors that, that come in and do all the microgreen planting <laughs> and cutting with her and, and they get a, a csa share every week and it's just it's, they're like a little social group on the farm that microgreen spot is a great place to be <laughs> and um and so there's a lot of different ways to get people involved on the farm whether it's through like a food share or through um just a one time you come out and volunteer or like a, a full paid job kind of piece of it it's amazing. I love the idea of all the, the elders in there doing the microgreens. And uh, that's so true, too, to kind of create community around ways to get people involved, whether it's like a group of high schoolers or, you know, people in your peer group. It's it's like book clubs. People never really read the books. That's not why they're there. They want to like catch up and chit chat and do all the other things around it. Right. So the fact that you guys are bringing together and creating spaces and circles where people can you know, do something with their hands while receiving that benefit and meeting you guys is, that's really, really potent and powerful. Appreciate it. I'm glad you guys have uh, elaborated on that so beautifully. Chris has a, Chris has like a technical question, which I dig these because I think I always learn something from them. So he's based in Fort Collins and he's curious if you recommend cover cropping in a home veggie garden with two by seven foot beds and like what crops do you guys recommend for your area? Yeah, for um above ground the raised beds uh, are great because sometimes you can have a lot better control weeds sometimes that it's harder to control temperatures in raised beds or compared to being right in, in the ground um so in the springtime like most greens are doing great in the tomatoes are great in there in the summertime because those are ground when it's going to get a lot hotter during the summer things like peppers and tomatoes are, are great eggplants even but i think one of the most important pieces is like being able to do some cover crops over the winter we work with we uh, probably our main cover crop that we use in in the winter here because we have a lot of sunny days all the way through um through the winter time and even if it's not warm enough to get veggies to grow like there you could be capturing that sunlight all winter long and be able to trap the sugars and trap that nutrients down into the biology in the soil 
And so to, so our main like go-to cover crop in the, for the winter, like when all our tomatoes and peppers come out, we go in with a mix of um, triticale, which is like a mix between uh, winter wheat and winter rye. So it has like the cold hardiness of a winter rye, but jumps up really fast in the spring, like a winter wheat. So we mix it, um, it's 50% triticale, 40% Austrian field peas, which is a great legume that can fix nitrogen in your soil and is like the most cold hardy legume we've ever seen. It like can be negative 10 out and it'll still be green and looking happy. <laughs> and then uh, a little bit of ha um, hairy vetch, like 10% hairy vetch is the other thing we put in, which is another legume that's a little bit more viney. And if you'd let that go in the spring, it'll, it'll actually like climb up your oats and make like a nice little canopy of flowers from the, and the native pollinators love that. Uh, so that's kind of our go-to cover crop mix in the winter time is the triticale and winter peas and hairy vetch. Uh, and we just source that from Pawnee Butte seeds, which is really close to, to you and Fort Collins there, there in Greeley. And we also sell bags of that at our, our farm tent in the fall. And we have a number of people with the raised beds that come in and sprinkle it on their, their gardens and send us pictures in, in March. Like, look how green my little garden is. And so then <laughs> in, in the spring before you plant, you just either mow it or take a weed whacker in there and whack all that debris down and with a fork kind of mulch it in into the soil and then plant right into that in the field we're mowing that in tilling it in and then and going in with our veggies right after that and that's what all the nutrients you need really to, to feed the, the next year's crop can come from that cover crop over the winter and you got all that beautiful sunlight all winter long and those days where it's like 50 degrees in February and the soil biology is waking up there's actually something there to feed them like it's nature hates bare, bare ground. And I think that's the, the biggest thing that we could do with agriculture on, on the national scale is to not have naked ground over winter. And um, especially places like Iowa where all those cornfields and soy fields are just bare all winter long. And sure enough, and if they get that hot day in, in February and the, and the biology is waking up, biology actually like breathes, it, it lets off CO2. And so if there's a little actually like they'll be emitting CO2 from this naked soil from all the biology waking up. And so when I first heard that, that's actually how they, um, they, they measure biological activity in the soil. The Haney test actually takes a dry soil and, and wets it with a little bit of water. And as the biology wakes up, they look at how much CO2 is given off and they can get an idea of how much biology is in that soil, the microbial activity. When I first heard that, I was like, wait a minute, I thought the microbes are supposed to be sequestering carbon here. They're releasing all this, this CO2 into the atmosphere. And, uh, but again, like nature, what, what does nature have? Nature doesn't have bare soil. It has a plant there with a green leaf that as soon as that CO2 is released, it's hitting that, that leaf and going right back into the system. You got this great like self-feedback loop and that's where nature takes off and does its thing. But if you don't have, you're missing that green plant, it just goes straight and you're adding to the, the, the CO2 in the atmosphere instead of taking it away. So even if it's healthy, healthy organic soil, if you don't have, that some some kind of plant in the ground, you're going to go backwards in the winter time when it gets warm. So that's that's kind of the key. that's why we're doing this big push at perennials. Like that's one of the ways to to make sure there's always something, even if it's a 40 foot every 40 feet having these shrubs that can can sequester something during the during the winter time and finding those cover crops that can be green even in a negative 10 degree day. And like as soon as that snow melts, so that those peas and those triticale can just look lush and green out there, and then just keep chugging away at that sequestration. That's so cool. Oh, wow. Okay. And can you repeat really quick who the source was for the cover crop seeds again? It's, uh, I, I'll, I'll type it in here. Okay. So yeah, Chris DM'd me. Yeah. That, I mean, as we're waiting, um, Henry has a, another question, but that that's why I love these technical questions. Like I just learned so much around the carbon cycle and how you're that curiosity of cover crops that in my mind almost creates this analogy of like a battery, like over the winter, the plants are there to be the battery to like feed the new growth that's coming in spring. So it's just amazing the way you explained that cycle really lit up that, that image in my mind. So super appreciate that. Henrik, I'm gonna pass to you to um, ask probably the final question around how community can support you and what are your needs? So I'll let you jump in and is it working? Okay, yeah, cool. I guess I can talk again, yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for sharing all that wisdom. Um, but now I got to what really excites me. If this community were able to support you, what kind of support would you want or what's really needed? Um, if you were to ask for help for anything, um, I mean, please feel free to think anything is possible. Where could we somehow help you? 
Well, I think talk with your friends and your community about all in farms. Uh, we always um, accept donations to plant trees and seeds or bring more kids to the farm or bring more interns to the farm. Um, but just another one is just follow the example and wherever you are, just try to mimic what we all should be doing and just be part of the change. So wonderful. That's what I will say. <laughs> what, what I'm trying to get at is that we have this wonderful community and there are so many people present here and so many people have knowledge, right? They're experts in A, B, C, Y thing. Um, could you think of something where you could actually uh, partner with somebody for whatever project, has some knowledge, contacts? Um, would that be helpful in any way? Could you think of any, any, any particular thing or issue? I think like technically, like one of the struggles we're having on like these bigger properties is we are so like hand oriented to like we're doing a lot of hand seeding, hand weeding. And as we go on to these like 20 acre to 30 acre fields on the new property that we really do need to kind of mechanicalize a little bit better, especially around uh, like weed control, where um, to get some kind of like a hot, big tired tracker we can drive over the crops and have somebody sitting there's the technology and like weeding like went away after the 50s so that's why you see a lot of these farmers like having these ancient tractors have these cultivating tractors that are just high mounted that you can drive over the crops and there's some pretty savvy things where somebody could be riding behind with these little rotating things that you could just be like going in and out of the they're controlling them with these levers going in and out of the pumpkin patch or the winter squash as they drive them down that's the only way I can see this, like we're gonna have to transition and invest in some kind of machinery like that. And they make new ones, but they're like 30 or $40,000. And um, if you get an old one, you gotta have an awesome mechanic, which you know, <laughs> we don't have, have yet. So we're kind of in this in between place. Like we invest in one of these or invest in an old one and find someone that can keep it up and running. Uh, so like ma machinery wise, I think that's a big piece of it. Um, finding partners with animals is another big piece. That's, we do have a couple of young farmers. Like when we look at that 135 acres, there's probably like 20 of it may be like actual veggie production and, and just alley crop plums. And a lot of it just should go back to perennial pasture. There's just not enough like water and uh, it might be the easiest way to control some of those weeds, to push those things back into perennial pastures and get young farmers on here rotating uh, sheep or cows in those areas. Um, I think like our biggest need right now is like it's just so much work like so much in the, and we have luckily like there's so many farmers out here that are like in this labor crunch where they just can't find help at all but because we've been so ingrained in the community and people trust us and people are moving in here like our, our two guys that moved here this year to help and work on the farm um we have the people but we don't always have like enough to pay them all year round like we still don't have a way to like pay these guys to stay over the winter when we do have all the time to be doing all this like on-farm composting and building refurbishing barns and doing all these projects that we'd love to do in the winter time often like it's there's just not getting enough generated in the veggie operation to like be able to keep these guys on all winter long working on all these awesome projects so i think that our biggest need is like some kind of fundraising effort so we could mm -hmm. keep these guys working all through october november december when the weather permits we could make a ton of progress over the winter if it wasn't just me tooling away <laughs> in the barn by myself uh, and we and we're we'll push through it regardless but things that we can make a lot more progress if we had the funding to like have some people dedicated to these kind of um stewardship and conservation practices like it's just there's just not enough in like your day-to-day -day veggie operation to like be pulling from that source of income to to fund all these the conservation labor that's needed mm. and so to, and to help fund that like all the there's a little project 95 um that's in the fundraiser that we have up now that's online and and that's the main thing we're fundraising for right now is to, to make a little bank of, of funding that will be available to these workers come october november when the season's winding down to really be able to expand our on-farm composting and be able to expand some of our planting and uh, get the trees all lined up to to expand our plum orchard next year and just start banking more perennial crops every everything that can i have 
in savings has always just gone straight to the farm. Like we're just, I don't know, maybe not the best of business approach. We just love this place <laughs> so much that whatever nature needs, we just throw it at her and, and, and hope for the best in return. And we're still standing after 14 years, which is a beautiful mm. thing. And um, there's, Sorry. it's always that, that, that's pretty much it it's it's, it's been a <laughs> challenge like we don't we don't get to take vacations or <laughs> get to fix our house up as much as we would like to or things like that but it's it, it's a trade-off but it's uh, at the same time it's, it's beautiful to see how the land has progressed and how the community has formed around the farm and how we're able to stay here and talk for an hour and a half on in the middle of a busy farming season because our older kids are out running the farm right now <laughs> and, and we have a great staff that has evolved around the farm over time like it's 12 years ago we wouldn't be able to be sitting here but <laughs> through all that time and, and being able to raise our own kids here and, and get the, the crew of people that can are passionate about the farm like they're out there doing amazing things right now while we've been sitting here and that's that's a little bit of progress <laughs> <laughs> guys that's so beautiful there's so much trust in that too and i want to be conscious of your time because i know we're just a minute over i have just one super final question and then we're gonna just wrap it up um and it's a real short um question so pretty much the last question is like if you if you had a billboard or like one really short just like sentence or sentiment um that you could put out to just the whole world or and really that you'd like to imprint on this group today from this session like what would that final message be kind of putting you on the spot too so if you don't got anything that's all right <laughs> uh, i don't know it's respect don't give up keep going as a community all together we can do it yeah, I think it, yeah, I was thinking about this earlier too. Like, there, so many there was a big gripe around organic farming or gender farming that it can never produce enough to to feed the world. Mm -hmm. And I think what these kind of communities really need to know is is we don't not need to just have a bunch of big regenerative farms trying to feed the world. We need a ton of small regenerative farms in every community and to really reshape the way we look at uh, a community uh, a community support agriculture and agricultural support the community like the farms need to be stay focused on their little community and the community needs to focus on how to keep those farms and their community going and 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 support over time and uh, i think if we bring back the scale a little bit like it's i love geometries and fractals and like if we can just get that one community core piece right just trust that it's going to resonate out and we're going to see policy change and things like that but i think we get lost in and looking at like global climate crisis and global weather patterns and, and global chaos and refugees that we sometimes forget to, to really invest wholeheartedly in that space that we're in and in that community that we're in and so i think that's been a big focus for ken and i over the last couple of years is just really just try to put our effort in the community and trust that those messages are going to resonate out over time Mm, bringing it back to local right I think that's so special and you guys are living it and your community is able to live it because of the amazing work that you are doing wow yeah, but there's so good. still some people that hello how's your day going oh good and they look at me like I don't know what you're doing this but I really admire you you know like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it and I was like well someone needs to do it right <laughs> yeah oh god I love that well I'm I'm so happy it's you too you guys have such a special <laughs> way of doing it oh gosh sorry i'm trying to share and it's not looking great okay sorry about that um i wanted to put up your guys yeah for henry it says a uh, check farmer farmertime.org what is that um, farmertime.org, I can answer. I just want to be conscious of people's time. Um, it's basically a, a, I think it's a nonprofit or an organization that connects farmers with, um, it zooms them into classrooms. So it's really beautiful. It's like this whole program that does that and just brings it directly into students' classrooms virtually. So that could be something that you guys could check out and get involved with too, because I know you're so passionate about the kiddos. So good. So, so good. Um, all right, gang. Well, I want to just share finally this, this last slide that I keep putting up the wrong slide and I don't know why that's happening. Apologies. Um, we are so excited to, okay, that's not working. So sorry. <laughs> Basically it's just these links. So feel free to follow along, um, with Mark and Kenna's work. 
And yeah, I think these sessions are so beautiful, just hearing in your guys' own words, like how donations go to directly supporting the ongoing work that you want to do, bringing people onto the farm, resourcing, you know, your continued growth and ability to like serve and also be held by your community. Um, that's what to me, I kind of hold really dearly and deeply as I move forward of just like knowing that, like how to stay involved. So thank you guys so much for sharing so many things across the board. Maya, so deeply appreciate your time and love and care that you put into working with Mark and Kenna on this feature and their story. And also just like bringing out that deep goodness and intimacy with them as you did in that first part of the session. And thank you everyone so much for joining. This was a really beautiful session. We're gonna stick around for about 10 more minutes for a community roundtable. So we'll have some open space to bring everyone off of Zoom. Just not let all this energy and passion and curiosity kind of float into the ether. Um, but Mark and Kenna, to be super respectful of your time, thank you so much for being so generous with it. Appreciate you guys. I and you guys. Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. Send you guys off back into the wild. Enjoy it. You guys have a great, awesome rest of your day. And yeah, reach out directly. This is their direct contact. So if you have any resources or ideas or ways that you want to get involved or drop them some resources, that's how. Thank you guys. Adios. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, Tori. See you guys. Bye, Maya. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And then for anyone else that wants to stick around, um, we'll be, like I said, we have about 10 minutes to just kind of ask everyone to unmute if we'd like. So everyone should have the ability now to unmute themselves. And this is kind of the, the chit chatty portion. Like I have been to so many webinars where you're like, wow, I'm so energized. I'm so inspired. And now I have nowhere to put that energy and no one to talk to about who just went through that capsule of an experience and learned all those things with me. So um, feel free to just bring anything that really resonated with you um, forward at this time. And we can kind of dive in a little bit deeper and Trice, I'm also so curious what you were making or eating or doing this whole entire time that looked awesome. <laughs> um, so just kidding, but yeah, I'm super, I'm happy to kick it off or Henrik, it looks like you're unmuted if you wanna share kind of how that session landed with you or what really came up or anyone else well i i'm curious about what it is that Teresa is uh, doing there. <laughs> maybe you would like to explain i think we can hear you now can you hear us trace is that how you say your name trace or trace trice trace. so because of mark and kina i uh helped him out after that flood that that occurred in 2013 and I moved back to Kentucky and started to learn how to grow food myself um, Mark came by twice and saw what I had done whenever he was taking Jimena across country and that has led me to where I am now I am farming turmeric in the great state of Florida. And wow. this, is, uh, this is what I get to dig up every day. Um, we sell turmeric juice, which is quickly becoming a very beneficial and direct way for people to heal, uh, not just inflammation, but the microbiome within themselves. Um, and it's been a passion that was spurred off because of Mark and Kina, and uh, I owe a lot to them, so. It's amazing. I'm so glad that you're here and that you know them directly and that Mark's kind of helped you get things kicked off and turmeric is amazing. What a healing plant with the curcumin and all that goodness inside of it. That's so rad that you're doing that in Florida. It's a great tropical climate for it. Uh, yeah. if, if I could That's ask, amazing. Um, you know them in person, right? You met them. Yes. If you had to answer that question that I was asking them, what would it? What would the answer be if you could see it from outside? That question is in regards to uh, what they could use the most help with. Yeah, that was one of them. Yeah. Um. So I think, I think examples, um, what I did in Kentucky, I 
did a whole lot of different examples. And whenever Mark uh, got back to Colorado, he, he flew me out that following Thanksgiving and uh, kind of laid the groundwork for how he is doing his perennials and the benefit of what, you know, a, a hedgerow of perennials will do for your annuals. Um, I think connecting other people, other farmers, uh, through your own ind independent research, uh, because they don't have time to come across somebody that uh, you highly revere and see, wow, they're doing something very different and it's obviously working. Um, and then to reach out to them and try to make bridge that, that connection um, looking at my life in retrospect, it's been the connections that have propelled me in the direction that I'm in. And that, that would be a kind of a, you know, no monetary input, uh, gravely beneficial thing. Um, cause I, I'm sure all of y'all are like me and you just, anytime you do have free time, you're looking up something related with food and our health and the agriculture system. So that uh, so yeah nice. absolutely great, great insight great insight thank you mm. yeah, i'm glad you asked that Henry. I, what i heard trice is just the idea of like mentorship like kind of like softer more relational apprenticing like how do you create real connections with farmers if that's the path that you're on and you know just get close to their work and kind of absorb there's like an awesome quote um like when you lay a log on another, on an already existing fire, um, the fire isn't any less bright or burning any hotter because of it. In fact, it fuels it. So there's something in that kind of exchange too around like Mark teaching and having the opportunity, you know, kind of solidifies his own knowledge, and makes him explain mm -hmm. it in a way that maybe helps, you know, others learn from it in future when he gets to talk about it. And then you go off with this deep imparted knowledge that and you also know you have a phone number of someone you can call and be like, wait, what happened here? And I'm messing up over here. And how do we go there? So there's so much love in that, right? Like so much support. And just, I think that's, that's what I've seen at least is, you know, it's really tough to explain to someone how to do farming unless you're there with them and unless you know them. Same with like understanding where your food is. Like it, it just gets so much easier when you're at least like right next to it or maybe at most one degree separated. So that's awesome. I really love that example. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. So good. Erin, how'd the session land with you? What was that? Sorry. How'd the session land with you? Was there anything oh, that? I thought it was great and really inspiring. Um, to me, hearing stories like that, it's a little bit overwhelming of like thinking about my community in order to do something like that, you need to make connections, right? Because it's such a large undertaking. And so I was just thinking about some of the farms at the farmer's market that I go to and um, really being more intentional about talking to the farmers at the stand and learning more about what they're doing and, and trying to build connections. Um, and yeah, I guess just being a little bit more conversational with people in, in that manner and see where it leads um, because yeah community is important that feels real yeah that feels really real I think there's kind of cognitive dissonance a little bit and I'm totally in that boat with you at times as well where you're like I care so much about this I'm living it I'm breathing it I'm at farmers markets and then you hear kind of a nugget of wisdom like this of like wow but if you can get on land with them or slow it down a little bit more like just ask them a few questions and have that deep bond you know yeah what who do they introduce you because they're like yo Aaron is so interested like she's really excited about this mm -hmm. and what comes of that kind of those sparking of connections it's true yeah and I think like um uh Trice was saying that you know I'll spend so much time on the internet looking things up but it's really um time to start taking that next step and actually digging my hands in the soil a little bit more I have a community garden plot um, but I, I think I could invest a little bit more time and energy into the surrounding area and, and people. So rad. I love it. You said, you said investing. That comes with a profit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good investment gives you more. 
right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so look out for that. I, I'm, I'm sure we'll touch base again, and then you'll tell me, yeah, I got more energy now than I had before. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So beautiful, guys. Wow. Um, well, I'd, I'd love to maybe be respectful of just everyone's time and say, if you guys are, unless there's anything else burning, I've got space if you want to bring anything else forward, but we can kind of wrap, send you guys back out into the, the wilderness of your day, farming turmeric and doing amazing things that Aaron's doing. And yeah, just gratitude for you guys. It was great to meet you, Trace. And um, yeah, thank you guys for coming and supporting Mark and Kenna. That was, it's really beautiful. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tori. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> mm-hmm.